Welcome to Ancestral Health Today, evolutionary insights into modern health. Welcome to Ancestral Health Today, a podcast providing evolutionary insights into modern health. I'm Todd Becker, and we're talking today with Terry Walls. Terry is a professor of clinical medicine at the University of Iowa, and through her own experience and her recovery from multiple sclerosis, She's developed a dietary framework for recovery from MS. It's called the Walls Protocol. I, she's summarized it in this great book here and on her website, which we'll have links for later on. And I first saw Terry give a very inspirational talk in 2012 at the Ancestral Health Symposium at Harvard. Um, and since then, she's given TED Talks. She's lectured around the world. Um, and she's refined her protocol, which has now been tested in several clinical trials. And the diet's based generally on paleo principles, functional medicine concepts, supported by research that Terry's done, and it can be customized to some extent to individual needs, and it's helped individuals with a variety of autoimmune conditions, not just MS. So thanks for joining us on Ancestral Health today, Terry. Hey, thanks for having me, Todd. Great. Um, I'd like to start out with your personal experience. And I understand that besides being a medical doctor and professor, you were an accomplished uh, runner, cross country skier. You climbed mountains and you did Taekwondo. And then somehow at some point you realized something was going on. Can you talk about how you first uh, realized that you might have multiple sclerosis? Yeah, you know, it was uh, 23 years ago, out walking with my wife, Jackie, a half mile from home. My left leg grows weak, you know, dragging it a hobble home. Uh, I see the neurologist who says, you know, this could be bad or really, really bad. Uh, and I think about the fact I've already had 20 years of worsening electrical face pains that start here coming down to my jaw. And, you know, Todd, actually I'm praying for a fatal diagnosis because I don't want to be disabled. Um, three weeks later, I hear multiple sclerosis. I uh, find the best MS center in the country, take the newest drugs, and three years later, I hear tilt recline wheelchair. I uh, take- A, a uh, reclining wheelchair, right? You were- you were Tilt recline, because it's- Totally- My core muscles are weak. Uh, I have severe fatigue. Uh, and I, uh, you know, treat my, I, I treat my disease aggressively. So I move on to uh, mitoxantrone, which is a form of chemotherapy. That does not help. Then I move on to Tizabri, the new biologic drug that was just out. That does not help. Uh, then I'm switched to Cellcept. And that's when I'm like, you know, it's very clear. This is uh, really going to be terrible. I'm clearly on track to become bedridden by my illness. Uh, and I decide to start reading the basic science. Uh, at first, I'm looking for uh, more drug studies. Then I uh, start looking for supplement studies. And I um, decide that mitochondria are what drives disability. Now, I should back up a little bit. I've been a vegetarian for 20 years, uh, and my neurologist had mentioned the work of Lauren Cordain. Uh, and so two years into my diagnosis, uh, after a lot of prayer and meditation, I went back to eating meat. And so that was a really so big you, deal. So Lauren Cordain, who wrote about the paleo diet. So you, you started out sort of on a paleo path. On a paleo path, I continued to decline. You know, so there's no grain, no legumes, no dairy. I'm still getting worse. Uh and I, but I, I'm like, well, who knows how long it's going to take to recover? Um, and at least I'm doing something. Uh, you know, that's when I start reading the basic science. I decide mitochondria are, are uh, the driver, and I create a supplement cocktail for my mitochondria. I, and it slows the speed of my decline. And I'm very, very grateful. What put you onto the track of mitochondria? So you were doing paleo. And something led you yeah. to mitochondria. What was it about mitochondria that made the connection with MS? Well, when I was reading the animal studies, I was looking for studies with shrinking brain, shrinking spinal cord. So ALS, Huntington's, 
uh, Alzheimer's, cognitive decline, dementia, and progressive MS. And mitochondrial dysfunction was a constant across all those diseases. So I thought, and, and no one was talking a lot about mitochondria for MS yet, but I thought um, it would make sense to me that mitochondria were key, and at least that was something that I could target. So, you know, I uh, slowly add in more supplements that are useful for my mitochondria. Uh, I can tell, uh, you know, it's actually sort of interesting. After six months of, of doing my mitochondrial cocktail, I got disgusted, like, okay, I'm really not that much better, and I quit. And 36 hours later, I could not get out of bed. I was just really could not function. And uh, 72 hours later, my uh, wife comes in and says, you know, honey, why don't you take uh, uh, the supplements again? So I'm like, okay. So I took them. And next morning I could get back up and go to work. And I thought, wow, that's really interesting. So uh, two weeks later, I did the same thing. I, what I, supplements are we talking about that you were taking? So at that reminder? time, it was uh, creatine, carnitine, uh, lipoic acid, coenzyme Q, and B vitamins. And um, it, w it was super interesting in that, you know, the next day I, I'm back to my usual level of fatigue. I could get up and go to work. Uh, and now, mind you, I'm still in the with my wheelchair. So, but I thought, wow, that's really interesting. So two weeks later, I stop everything. And at 36 hours, I can't get out of bed. I'm exhausted. I, even more exhausted than usual. It's uh, hard to function. I wait by 72 hours. Then I take my supplements again. And the next morning, I can go to work. And so I think, hey, I'm learning stuff that my neurologist is not telling me. Uh, and I'm very excited. I'm uh, uh, much more into uh, scanning the literature. I'm, tell, and I'm, uh, I'm a member of the Institutional Review Board, so I'm reviewing research um, every month. And I tell the review committee that please send me uh, all of the human brain-related studies. So I was getting more and more comfortable uh, reading uh, the research. And over the next couple of years, you know, I'm still declining declining, declining, I'll be a little more slowly. Um, in the summer of uh, 07, my chief of staff tells me he's gonna sign me to the traumatic brain injury clinic up to start in January, uh, about six months. And he describes the job, I, I won't have residents in the clinic, I'll be part of a multidisciplinary team and I'll have to examine the, the vets myself uh, and write the notes. So you were working and, all this time as a doctor. Oh, fortunately, I, I haven't had cognitive decline. So, you know, the residents would see the patients and I would staff and they would discuss the cases and I would staff them. And I would review uh, studies uh, for the IRB uh, for clinical trials. So, so I'm still working. I'm beginning to have a little brain fog. And I think uh, this was my chief of staff, John's way of, saying, Terry, I don't think you can do your job. We're going to put you in a job that you can't do, so you'll have to take medical retirement. But, you know, I think now in retrospect, I think God was whispering in his ear to put me in that job uh, because two weeks later, I uh, reviewed a study with electrical simulation of muscles uh, and that was used for people who had been paralyzed who would never be able to walk again. And so... I wondered, you know, could that help me uh, get a quick search? There's only 212 papers. It didn't take me that long to read all those abstracts. And they're just a handful uh, with cerebral palsy uh, and stroke. Nothing uh, in MS. But I convinced my physical therapist to let me have a test session, uh, and we added it to my physical therapy. Then at that same time, I discovered the Institute for Functional Medicine, and they had a course on neuroprotection. So it was, and it was all about the mitochondria. So I was uh, super excited. I had a longer list of supplements. 
uh, which I added. And then I had this really big aha, Todd. And now in retrospect, I, I laugh at myself that it took me this long to have this aha. What if I redesigned my paleo diet based on this long list of supplements I was taking? And I said, like, where, where are these nutrients in the food supply? Really, really key point, because you were doing a paleo diet and you were taking handfuls of supplements. And uh, the question is, could you get everything from food, right? Do you have to take tons well, of supplements? Yeah. And then I was also recognizing that our food is much more complicated than the supplements. That, you know, there's tens of thousands of compounds in the food that we eat. Um, that we've not even named or described that you know our 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 bodies somehow use to nourish us. So I thought, well, I, I you know, I'd probably get other really good things for me if I ate a diet that concentrated on these. And there was like, um, you know, there there are now seventeen nutrients that we track, uh, but you know. And, and when I asked my dietitian colleagues where these nutrients were in the food supply, they said, well, um, um, I, I don't know. Uh, they went to the library. There were really good resources there. So I went back to the Internet. Uh, and the Linus Pauling Institute for Micronutrients uh, was super helpful. Uh, so I reorganized my paleo diet. Then now, just as important as what to avoid is what to stress. So uh, it, the story gets pretty dramatic. Now, in, in 2007, you know, in December, I, I'm beginning to have brain fog. I have trigeminal neuralgia. My uh, level of pain is really uh, extremely difficult. I have uh, weak torso muscles, so I couldn't sit up like I am now. I was in a zero gravity chair with my knees higher than my nose. I could take just a couple of steps. If I sat in a regular chair like this, I could only do so for about 10 minutes. If I sat longer than that, uh, I was just completely exhausted. And that, by the way, Todd, is the definition of being bedridden. It's good that I did not know that at the time. Uh, so I, I start this new way of eating, December 26th. Um, and then in January, uh, I go to the traumatic brain injury clinic. And the first two weeks, I'm just in my tilt recline wheelchair watching my partners uh, do the exams. And then the third week of January, it's time for me to start examining the veterans and writing the notes for them. And that first day I come home, and, you know, it was not too bad. I was so, sort of surprised. and. At the end of the week, you know, I, I tell Jack, you know, that's not too bad. I think I can do this. And I also say, uh, I want to sit in a regular chair for supper because I feel like, you know, I, I am stronger. Uh, so we, we get the regular chair and I have supper uh, sitting at the, at the chairs upright, normally. Uh, very exciting. When I see my physical therapist, my physical therapist says, Terry, you're definitely stronger, and he advances my exercises. So now I'm doing 10 minutes of mat exercises twice a day with my electrical stimulation muscles. And then we, we keep advancing them. Uh, and uh, in February... Maybe you could just fill us in on, you're talking about electrical stimulation. That was something you had started? Oh, sure. mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so electrical stimulation tends is something that people use to help uh, over sensory nerves to help with pain. It's a slightly different frequency. If you put it over motor nerves and muscles, you can uh, get more muscles to contract. And this is very helpful for people who are paralyzed so the muscles are still doing work and we are, we're uh, blocking the harm of inactivity. By, but th they're still never going to walk. Um, and then uh, on, f for me, I would volitionally contract the muscle 
and I'd you know dial up the current, and uh, I'd get electrically driven contraction as well. So I get a, a bigger workout, and I could tolerate the workout when I had an electrical augmentation. My physical therapist had said, Terry, I can definitely grow bigger muscles. What I do not know is if your brain can talk to the bigger muscles that we grow. It's possible I may be making dead weight on your legs, and we may be making it harder for you to walk. So you want to be sure I understood that. Yeah, I could be making circumstances worse for myself. The other thing that was super interesting, Todd, was every time I did the electrical stimulation, uh, which, by the way, was uh, quite painful because I, I, you know, being a former athlete, like, by God, I was really nothing on the table. Like, you know, I figured more would be better. And so I would dial up the current and I'd be sweating from the intensity of the, of the current. Um, it did really good things for my mood and my mental clarity. Uh, and so uh, the electrical stimulation. <laughs> Uh, and so you know, at the end of January, my physical therapist says, you're definitely stronger. He's advancing my exercises. I believe at the end of February, um, I decide to mail a letter. So people see me walking in the hallway, now with walking sticks, but for the first time in four years, you know, which stuns everyone. Uh, and then um, in March, I'm walking with one walking stick and then with by the end of March, no walking sticks. Yeah, and in April, I um, am talking with uh, my wife, Jackie, that you know, I'd like to try riding my bike, which I've not done in six years. And she says, well, you know, if things are, keep going well, maybe we can do that uh, in the fall. Well, on Mother's Day, uh, we have to have an emergency family meeting because I really want to try riding my bike. Uh, and so uh, Jackie tells my son, Zach, who's six foot five and he's 16, Zach, you jog alongside on the left. She tells Debbie, my uh, 13 year old daughter, you jog alongside on the right. Uh, and that she'll follow. So we all get in a position. She gives the all clear and I push off. And I bike around the block. That's amazing. Now that big 16-year-old boy, he's crying. The 13-year-old girl, she's crying. Jackie's crying. It, it, and when I relive that moment, I cry, even now. Because, you see, Todd, when you have progressive MS, or a progressive neurologic disorder, one of the things you do is you let go of the future. You learn to accept what each day as it unfolds. And so even though I'd been walking around the block, I didn't know what any of it meant because I'd let go of the future. But when I, when I biked around the block, I realized that the current understanding of progressive neurologic disorders, including progressive MS, is incomplete. And who knows how much recovery might be possible. And so Terry, this is this is I, an incredible story. I mean, it's emotional. It's so remarkable to have that kind of recovery from being flat on your back and then you're walking you with sticks and, you, and then you can ride a bike. I mean, that's transformational. And then so I kept biking a little bit further. In October, uh, Jackie signed us up for the Courage Ride, which was 18.5 miles. And, you know, when, and when I crossed that finish line, you know, we're all crying again. But I, did, I biked 18.5 miles. And, you know, I can bike for hours. I, I went up to, um, I can jog in the neighborhood. Not fast, but I can jog. So, no, I, I'm not normal. I'm not going to be um, athletic in, in the way that I once was athletic. But, you know, I have a very rich and amazing life. And, and it, you know, it certainly transformed um, how I think about disease and health. It will transform the way I practice medicine. And it will transform the type of research that I do, Todd. 
And I, and I truly made it my mission that I want everyone with multiple sclerosis and a systemic autoimmune condition to be told, yes, we may have FDA approved drugs that we can offer you, but just as important is addressing your diet and lifestyle. And, and we're making headway on that. It's incredible. I just want to rewind to where we are. So you, you did the paleo diet, you at, you looked at supplementation, you did the research and added nutrients that could help with mitochondria. And you even expanded what you ate to make sure you're getting the right things. And you did the electrical stimulation. Were you taking any, still taking any disease modifying drugs at this time or had yeah. you discontinued that? No, you know, interesting. So at that time, I was taking Celsept, which is uh, a drug uh, given to people with transplants. It does suppress your immune system. Uh, and, and I've had uh, three, three relapses uh, in the whole disease course. When I walked into my neurologist's office uh, in April of 2008 um, and told him what I'd done, showed him my e stem device, uh, and we talked about whether or not I could be tapered off my uh, disease-modifying drug treatment. He said, yeah, let's do that because it, they really didn't help you. Uh, and you're old enough that, that, that the uh, risk of harm uh, over the age of 50 begins to be increased. So he tapered the uh, cell sept over two weeks and then uh, stopped it. And I've not been on any disease-modifying drug treatment since then. And I still see my neurologist twice a year. I still get periodic uh, MRIs. And you, you, I'm old enough that you would not expect me to have any relapses because people quit having relapses and no enhancing lesions, uh, generally starting around age 45 to 50. And certainly by 55, it'd be very, very rare to have a relapse. But what they have is this progressive decline, worsening disability. Uh, we're, uh, we're seeing brain volume loss and cognitive decline. And of course, the exact opposite has happened. I, I'm getting stronger and stronger. Um, and, and, you know, I am getting older, so I'm probably having some age related brain volume loss. But, you know, I'm doing research, writing papers, uh, teaching clinicians around the globe. Um, so I, I, I'm doing really very well. You, you've turned the corner and more so. Um, so incredible story. And I, I want to build on that, but I, I want to come in back to your key insight, which I think seemed to really move things in a new direction. And that was your focus on mitochondria. And, you know, there's been a lot of theorizing and there's studies about what's the cause of MS. Some people look at viral infections like Epstein-Barr. There's a lot of association there. There was this uh, theory of cerebral venous insufficiency, which may be a piece, but didn't really play out. So are the, what's your view of what's the cause? And does it all come back to mitochondria? Or is there one cause? Is, are there many causes? What causes MS? <laughs> so there's, there's a, a sequence of things that need to happen. First, you have to have genetic vulnerability. Right now, we identified about 300 genes that increase the risk for having uh, MS. And each gene uh, might increase the risk about 1%, 2%. There are just a couple of genes that increase the risk about uh, 10%. The vast majority is just a tiny, tiny increase. Then step two is having an infection. And there are 16 different microbes that increase the risk for having MS or another autoimmune disease. And Epstein-Barr is one of them. Uh, so is the coronavirus. Uh, so is strep, uh, staph, uh, Lyme disease. Uh, and again, there, there are 16 microbes that have been identified. So step one, step two. Step three is developing a leaky gut. And step four is all those other environmental factors. Uh, diet, uh, physical activity, uh, sleep stress, social connectedness, being lonely, uh, uh, toxin exposure, uh, 
uh, your overall gut health, uh, the microbiome, uh, the microbes you have in your gut, on your skin, in your mouth, uh, on your genitals, in your vagina. All those factors will either let the disease be very mild or very severe and aggressive. So the list you just gave uh, sounds like a list that could apply to other, many auto, autoimmune diseases, maybe all of them. Would many, many autoimmune diseases. And so this approach w would absolutely work. At, at, and clinically, uh, we see this approach working very well for things like rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, systemic lupus, uh, uh, Hashimoto's, uh, uh, Graves' disease. Uh, psoriasis, uh, any of those autoimmune skin disorders. You know, there, there are 80 plus systemic autoimmune diseases and using this framework would be very helpful. Now, see, it's not a matter of I'm going to do diet, lifestyle, functional medicine, ancestral health principles, or I'm going to do a conventional medicine, disease modifying drug treatments. You can do both. You can decide that you know, my systemic autoimmune disease is not too bad. It's fairly mild, just got diagnosed. I don't have any significant disabilities. I'm going to lean into the functional medicine ancestral health principles and see if that will be enough. Uh, but a close follow-up, and so if it's not, then I could add the DMTs. Or you may decide that, you know what, I want to treat my disease very aggressively because I don't want to be disabled, so I'm going to do both. I'll do the disease-modifying drug treatments immediately, and I'll do a diet and lifestyle immediately. But certainly everyone should be doing both, should be doing diet and lifestyle. Yeah. So the pattern you described, you said, is not just MS, it's arthritis, lupus, you know, it's the same pattern. But so that's the commonality. Then what makes the different autoimmune diseases different? What makes them distinctive? Ah, well, so... The um, a concept called molecular mimicry. Uh, so the amino acid sequence, in uh, in my case, I'm sensitive to gluten, dairy, and eggs, and we know that uh, dairy proteins and gluten proteins have amino acid sequences in those food proteins that are also have some amino acid sequences that are similar to brain structures. And so when I developed a food sensitive reaction, the immune reaction to those food proteins, it also reacted to the proteins in my brain, which led to my having autoimmunity. And again, depending on your genetics uh, and the food sensitivity that you develop and the infections that you've had, if there are similar amino acid sequence to the microbes, to your some of your brain structures or lung structures or skin structures, when you go after those microbes, you accidentally go after your, your own body as well. And okay, so that's why Epstein Bar, Epstein Barr, which has a particular motif, might cross react with something that's going after the myelin protein. So they are these. This is the molecular image, and that's different for each autoimmune condition. And it's, and it's different for each person. And remember, we're all a little bit different. Our amino acid sequences in our structures are a little bit different. Yeah, and so the concept of molecular mimicry is the food proteins and the uh, proteins in the uh, structures of the viruses and the bacteria. Uh, and by the way, we, we never completely eliminate the virus or the bacteria. I rolled up. I have enough gray hair that when I went to medical school, I was taught that your brain and your bones and your blood and your urine was sterile. Now that we have the technology that we can look for the DNA and the RNA in all of those spaces, it's shocking. My brain is not sterile. You know, um, it, it, nor is my blood or my bones or my urine. My immune cells are keeping it mostly in check, so I stay healthy and vigorous. But as I get older, my, my immune cells are gradually less and less competent 
And that contributes to why we have more uh, infection, why we may have more cancer, and probably why we have more cognitive decline, because the microbes in, in my brain create more mischief. Now, um, uh, and I think the way that we accelerate aging is the standard American diet, high in sugar, high in uh, carbs, uh, continuous eating, uh, uh, no hormetic stresses. That leads to um, uh, accelerated aging of the brain, accelerated aging of our immune cells, accelerated aging of our mitochondria, you know, accel accelerated aging uh, of the whole organism. But you know, the good news is we, we can reverse that uh, and certainly slow it, uh, and we can use it. So some of the things you're saying um, we hear a lot about in the ancestral community in terms of eliminating some of the potential allergens or infections that can in initiate this inflammatory process. So that's the avoidance part. But in your protocol, maybe we can start to get into the diet. You're actually adding nutrients and you're adding things that you say uh, overcome uh, some of the weakness or strain on the mitochondria and yeah. build the mitochondria. How does that work? How does diet help restore your mitochondria? You know, it's, it, it's super interesting. I had gone paleo, no grain, no dairy, uh, and you know, still uh, and, and no legumes, and still declined. Um, the magic happened, and had all these supplements uh, declined more slowly, uh, but still declined. When I went back and said, okay, where are these foods, uh, it, where are these ingredients of the food supply? Man, that's when the magic happened uh, in surprisingly rapid uh, uh, space. Uh, and I, you know, I'm eating huge amounts of green leafy vegetables. Uh, and for the first four years, if I didn't get my extraordinary amount of green leafy vegetables, at about 36 hours, I could tell my cognition was not as clear. And my energy was not as good. Super interesting. After, and I, so, and I was feeling well enough that I could travel to uh, do lectures, you know, uh, like the one that you saw at Harvard. So I travel with cabbage, uh, I travel uh, with green drinks uh, because, you know, I was eating a huge amount of non starchy vegetables. Uh, now I'm a little more ketogenic. I have more resilience because I'm further into my recovery. Yeah, and so I still eat a lot of green leafy vegetables, but if I don't get my three cups of greens every day, uh, um, you know, I, I can go to a, a scientific conference and I'm not having cognitive problems. I could not have done that in the first three years. You mentioned green leafy vegetables um, in your protocol, I think you have yeah. three different categories, at least of vegetables, and yeah, you have, so, can you talk about that? Yeah, so we'll, we'll talk about the ads. When I, when I use this concept in my clinic, I stress uh, with my vets that, that we do the ads first because it's easier to add than subtract. So the goal is nine cups of, vet, of vegetables. And they'd say like, is that per month or per week? So no, no, that's per day. Three cups of green leafy vegetables, three cups of sulfur rich in the cabbage, onion, and mushroom family, uh, and that uh, in three cups of deeply colored like carrots, beets, berries. The green leafy uh, are a great source of of uh, calcium, magnesium, vitamin K, uh, and your back, gut bacteria will metabolize them to a more active form of vitamin K that we need. And we know in the animal models. Uh, uh, vitamin K is very helpful for myelin uh, and for brain stem cells. And was that why I, I was so sensitive to uh, green leafy uh, in the beginning, uh, perhaps? Uh, the green leafies are also vital for retina health, uh, eye health, uh, and for cognition. The uh, cabbage family, onion family, uh, uh, great sources of sulfur. Uh, very, very good for uh, brain neurotransmitters. Mushrooms, 
again, very good for brain neurotransmitters and good for uh, brain nerve growth factors. Uh, and we know in multiple studies that the more mushrooms you eat, the lower the rates of anxiety, depression, uh, and uh, cognitive decline. Uh, deep colors, particularly blue, purple, black, uh, very good, again, for cognition. And there's a lower cause, lower rates of all-cause mortality, cancer, heart disease, diabetes, uh, diabetes, uh, and obesity. So uh, a lot of reasons to have those colors. Yeah, I think that that's that, yeah, that's really helpful to have those three different categories because they are all performing different functions, right? You, you really want to have some of each, the, the green leafies, the sulfur rich and the colors, right? And you want to um, ha um, have sufficient meat. Uh, a simple way to think about that is uh, meat or fish, uh, two palm sized servings of meat or fish uh, every day. Uh, and then you have your sulfur, your vegetables as what uh, is the other stuff that you eat. Um, if you're if you're a guy or a tall lady, I'm six foot tall, uh, you should be able to get your nine cups in. If you're petite, um, then it's going to be proportionately less. It, it is, it's not that you have to uh, force yourself to eat food beyond your appetite. I, I don't want people to be hungry, but I want them to eat foods that are good for them. So first we get them to eat all their vegetables, make sure they're having enough meat, and that's it, then eat what you want. And what they discovered is, well, if they ate all those vegetables, they ate their meat, they weren't really hungry after that. And that and that was that was the goal. Now, people who are very petite, particularly my four foot 10 ladies, they're, they're having more like four to six cups. Of vegetables. So Terry, um, what specifically are you, are we looking for in meat and fish? How is this helping? Well, you know, for my vegetarian friends, um, their, their diets are low in branch chain amino acids. And that leaves them vulnerable to not having a protein in their diet, uh, leaves them vulnerable to having sarcopenia, uh, loss of muscle mass. Uh, and that will make uh, insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, much more likely. Uh, and so I'm wanting them to have uh, meat for the complete protein. I'm wanting them to have uh, plenty of carnitine. Uh, and if they're having uh, liver, uh, they're going to get uh, coenzyme Q. Uh, they're going to get minerals, zinc, um, uh, magnesium. Uh, copper that's readily and easily absorbed. Um, if you're getting minerals from plant sources, it's not quite as readily absorbed. Uh, the, the one thing that, the one nutrient that's not very plentiful in meat is vitamin C. And if you cook your meat, you tend to destroy all the vitamin C. Uh, and then I, I'm not going to be very enthusiastic about raw meat because of the risk of bacterial infection uh, and parasites from raw meat. Now, our, our, our traditional societies, if you look at the Inuit uh, and the societies that are um, basically more carnivore, have very little carbohydrate intake, those societies uh, had a lot of fermented meat and a lot of raw meat. And uh, that's not what, yeah, yeah. Is that what people are doing uh, here in the U.S.? Uh, it's certainly not what I'd feel comfortable recommending. Yeah. So within the communities that we, we both circulate, the ancestral community, people who are looking at paleolithic uh, nutrition as inspiration, there's a lot of emphasis on grass-fed meat, wild-caught fish, um, and, the, and there's reasons for this, right? And there's an emphasis on liver and bone breath, but there's some people who may have an aversion to some of these foods. The cost or availability may be limited. What do you say? How, can you adapt this to people who either have financial limitations or some aversion to the tastes? Actually, Todd, that is a, a really good point. 
in my traumatic ranger clinic and in the uh, therapeutic lifestyle clinic at the VA, we often had people who were not working, who were disabled by their illness. Uh, they were shopping at small rural grocery stores uh, in Iowa, so there's some food deserts. And so we, in fact, taught them how to do some beans and rice and some vegetarian meals. Uh, and we taught them uh, that, at least here in the Midwest, many communities have um, controlled hunts to deal with the overabundance of, of deer. So you could get venison for free. Uh, and uh, many folks had friends and colleagues uh, who were hunters and fishermen so they could access uh, meat and fish that way. Uh, we had classes on uh, foraging uh, and gardening to make it more affordable. Uh, we also talked about how the, the biggest problem is 40% uh, of the food in, in the United States is thrown away. That, that's shocking. 40% of the food that we buy, either um, the groceries, because we never get around to cooking it, or we cook it and there's leftovers and we never get around to eating them. Uh, and, and in the restaurants, uh, foods are thrown away. So planning, learning how to cook, learning how to plan for leftovers so that you have a meal and you uh, learn how to plan for leftovers and eat the leftovers. One, it, it saves time in, in terms of, I, I don't have, to, I only cook like three times a week because it takes time to cook. So I cook and I plan for leftovers. I, and a lot of our folks don't know how to meal plan. They don't know how to uh, shop. They don't know how to plan for efficient cooking strategies so they can batch cook and not have to cook every day, three times a day. And um, that makes doing the loss protocol much more affordable. That makes eating for health much more affordable in terms of the time burden and the cost burden. It sounds like you've done some education on this. Can you say a little bit more? Oh, yeah. So in, in our clinics, we would um, we would have uh, skills classes uh, once a week. And we have some cooking classes, meditation classes, movement classes to teach people these skills because people aren't necessarily learning how to uh, meal plan, uh, grocery shop, uh, plan their menus. Uh, they aren't necessarily learning how to incorporate exercise into their daily routine. Uh, and, um, so, and, and we also had skills classes on how you grow your motivation because uh, acquiring any new health behavior habit requires some effort. Uh, just as uh, extinguishing a habit that you want to stop requires some effort. Adding a new habit that you want to utilize uh, requires some effort. Uh, so we're very upfront. We acknowledge that. And then we have um, uh, at, at our most popular skills classes were those about how we grow our internal motivation. And, and following on, on what you're just saying about the, the, uh, the clinics and the uh, information, is this available on your website and your book for people who want to learn yeah, some of these so things? We have, um, yeah, we, we have a bunch of uh, programs uh, to give people more support for adapting the principles that we've been discussing, Todd. Uh, the, we have a lovely online course, the Autoimmune Adventure Mastery Course, uh, which, by the way, um, we, we did a randomized uh, controlled trials testing, does access to the Autoimmune Adventure Mastery Course lead to reduce fatigue, improve quality of life. Uh, and in fact, uh, it did. Um, we had, uh, we randomized people to either get immediate access or wait 12 weeks and then they got access. Uh, we followed everyone for 24 weeks. Um, we had a masked statistician who uh, did all the analyses uh, and you know, reached the conclusion. Uh, so that paper was just published. Uh, so I'm, I'm very excited. So there are a bunch of courses out there, but I, I'm like the only one that does any research to, to show that the stuff that I say works actually works. Uh, so our online course works. Uh, the Autoimmune Adventure Master course, uh, we, it's been shown to 
reduce fatigue, improve quality of life. Then the uh, diets that we study, uh, uh, WALS level one, level two, um, uh, again have been shown to um, reduce fatigue, improve quality of life, uh, improve walking function and hand function. In several studies now, uh, we have uh, a ketogenic diet study uh, that uh, the study was too small for me to be able to say whether or not uh, that was helpful. We have a larger ketogenic diet study, uh, and we that will know at the end of 2026. We'll have all of our data. We'll be analyzing it and probably presenting it, hopefully in scientific meetings in 2027. So, Todd, you'll have to have me come back, and then I can tell you all about that study. That's great. And now we're getting into, I think, one of the topics that's really interesting here, and that is your work on clinical trials, because your personal story is amazing. It's an N of one, and you can probably work with a small group of people in clinics. But if you really want to transform medicine, if, if a, somebody's going to the neurologist and they say, hey, I heard about this great uh, Walsh protocol diet, uh, the, the practitioners have to believe in it and the only and their standard is to look at randomized control po- trials and you've done a lot in that in the 10 years since I've heard you can you describe so first of all give us an overview of what are the clinical trials you've done and then what is what is it what are you about to do randomized control trial is what you need to do so you have the intervention compared to control group uh, and then you see does the intervention, is it helpful? And we look at fatigue and quality of life as the primary outcomes. And then secondary outcomes have to do with uh, walking, hand, vision function, uh, cognitive function. We've done uh, seven trials. We're in our eighth clinical trial uh, right now. Uh, in our seven uh, earlier trials, uh, some variation of the Walls diet has led to reduced fatigue, improved quality of life. Uh, and improvement in a variety of uh, clinical functions that we measure, uh, walking and hand function. Uh, We are presently, and then I I should say, Todd, so we have a uh, network meta-analysis that uh, 12 studies looking at eight diets, a modified paleo, um, Mediterranean, low-fat, ketogenic, anti-inflammation, fasting pattern, calorie restriction, and usual diet. There were 608 uh, uh, individuals in those 12 studies. And what we saw is for reducing fatigue, the paleo diet, Mediterranean diet, low-fat diet, those three were helpful. Paleo diet being about 50% more effective than either Mediterranean or low-fat. And then for improving quality of life, for physical health and mental health quality of life, it was the paleo diet and the Mediterranean diet. And the paleo diet was twice as effective as the Mediterranean diet. And uh, that was in neurology, the highest impact journal that uh, is out there. And this is a, rec- a recent st- recently published study, right? The neurology study? Recently published. It was published uh, 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 about six months ago, six months earlier. And this this is the one that compares the different um, diets. It uh, compares different diets, and because it's a network meta-analysis, they're able to rank order most effective to least effective. And the um, journal had an editorial with uh, uh, published that said, you know, we now have good evidence that diet really matters, and that people with MS should all be told that diet really matters. They should be referred to a nutrition professional who can help them improve their diet. They should eat more vegetables, less sugar, less processed food. And if one of these diet plans speaks to them, whether it's the Mediterranean, (coughs) paleo diet, low-fat diet, or even a ketogenic diet, or or intermittent fasting, they should be encouraged to improve their diet. So the the Walls protocol was one of those diets. Uh, where did it come out, particularly as it? What was its main strength so, over the other uh, diets? It was it was the most effective. It was fifty percent more effective than either Mediterranean or uh, low fat. 
it was twice as effective as the Mediterranean diet. And the uh, modified paleo diet was the studies that we did, uh, basically, that were looking at level two of the WALS protocol. Just to back up a little bit, this was um, how many people over how long a period of time? Uh, it sounds well, like a pre pretty big so studies. That is a com what they do is they combine all of the studies. So they combined 12 studies. Uh, you had to have a diet intervention that lasts at least four weeks, and you need to have a it had to be randomized. So some of the studies were uh, controlled uh, with a control arm, and some were what we call parallel arms, where they're combining, uh, comparing two or more uh, arms. And these were all uh, MS patients. Were they uh, primary so progressive? MS patients who had MS confirmed by at least the uh, McDonald's uh, criteria of 2010 or 2006. Um, or 2017. So uh, neurology confirmed uh, MS diagnoses. And was it relapsing remitting? There's a progressive MS. It could be uh, relapsing remitting or it could be progressive MS. Wow, well, this would be great um, reference to show to your neurologist if you're if you're wanting to get uh, help oh, there, right? Um, and uh, Todd, I will make sure you have a copy of both the uh, network meta-analysis uh, uh, link uh, for that and a link for the accompanying editorial that said, we now have good evidence that diet matters and that everyone should be getting a referral to a nutrition profession. So we'll get you those. We, we can put it in our, in our show notes as a reference. I think uh, that would be very helpful, Terry, as a guide. Thank you. So um, sure. maybe, I guess I just want to go back a little bit because it's amazing that you've done this many clinical trials. If, was it hard in the beginning? Did you have a lot of resistance? Was it was it hard to get funding for this? Because this you don't get funding for these trials very easily if you're not selling a drug. So um, you know, what's really helpful is that my chair of medicine at the university is a rheumatologist. So he understood that, you know, secondary progressive MS is a progressive disorder. He was thrilled to see me walk in because he hadn't seen me walking in four years. Uh, and he, in that first meeting in 2008, he said, Terry, I want you to uh, write a case report because a single case report can change everything. It can change the direction uh, of, of medicine. Uh, and so I like on myself said, yes, work with your treating neurologist and physical therapist, but get that written up. So we wrote, I wrote it up, uh, and then he said, write a little case series, because by then we had a few, my physical therapist had a little case series going, so we wrote that up. And then he said, and as I'm doing all this, write up the protocol, because the next you're going to do at what's called a safety and feasibility study. And I said, well, you know, Dr. Rothman, that's not the kind of research that I do. Just, I will get you the mentors, this is your assignment. This is what I need you to do because what has happened is so important. We need to see can other people do what you did, and if they if they do what you did, what happens to them? So uh, he got me the mentors. Um, we had a, uh, we took about an, a, a year to get the protocol written up, submitted, uh, and with the changes that my the the committee that reviews research required, I was going to have to raise about a hundred thousand dollars. And I thought, okay, well, this is going to be not going to happen. But I was able to convince uh, the MP company to give me access to uh, the electrical stimulation devices and the supplies for 20 people. And a group in Canada, Direct MS Charity, gave me $50,000 to cover uh, the supplement costs uh, and some uh, testing costs that I would need to do. And we're able to do the study. So the IRB said, do 10, give us the safety report, and then you can do the next 10. And I found a PhD student who wanted to do this as her thesis pro dissertation project, so that was helpful. Um, 
we did the first 10, we were ready to publish those findings. It took me two years to find a journal that would publish those findings. But, you know, it, and I, I was, we presented the findings uh, at a scientific meeting in uh, 2011. Uh, and it was not, and so we had the manuscript ready in 2011. It wasn't until 2014 that I was able to get it published. But after we got the first one published, and by then we had uh, the second 10 through, so, so we had our, our manuscript with 20 people in it, and we got that published in 2015. And then we um, were able to start you know, our uh, third clinical trial and our fourth clinical trial. Uh, and I went back to the uh, group in Canada. They gave me some funding to do some more. At this time, a small randomized controlled trial. So we got those going. Uh, and my book came out. And, and mind you, I uh, had been banned as a speaker uh, by the MS Society because they thought my 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 message was dangerous. The uh, I had been giving a lecture to the medical school about what it's like to have, be diagnosed with a progressive neurologic disorder and become progressively more disabled. And it was a very, very uh, popular lecture. It's one of the highest rated lectures in the medical school curriculum. But when I was able to talk not about progressive disability, but about the fact, yeah, I became disabled, but you know what? I, I, I now bike and hike and, you know, this remarkable recovery. Then my talk became controversial, and I was pulled from the medical school curriculum, and all that happened in 2009. So I just kept going where I was invited. So I, I came out and spoke with uh, the Ancestral Health uh, sy Symposium and talking at uh, regional conferences where I was invited, uh, and then national conferences where I was invited, uh, and we're submitting our, our research and our posters and our manuscripts, and we are. Our, our work is slowly being cited by other folks. It's then uh, my book, I uh, get the TED talk in 2011 that goes viral, uh, which probably annoys a lot of neurology because that people are coming and say, well, what about that doc in, you know, in Iowa? Uh, and then um, my book comes out in 2014 and is a bestseller, huge bestseller. And the MS Society monitors social media, so they see that their constituents are now talking about the WALS protocol, diet, um, meditation, exercise, self-care, and they decide they have to have a wellness conference, uh, and they want to bring their scientists and patient advocates to talk about the gaps in the research. Uh, I, and they track me down and invite me, I say, well, I'll come, but you have to unban me. I need that in writing. And, and, and they did. They unbanned me. It took them a couple hours. They got me unbanned. I rearranged my schedule. So I went and um, helped them understand that, yes, if we're going to make diet research and lifestyle research a priority, they have to have a different way, a different set of experts review the studies because this is a very different science than drug discovery study. That they need people who do diet research, they need people who do exercise research, and who do uh, mindfulness research to review the proposals. So, where is the MS Society? Where is the MS Society on this now? I I think you you've given talks there. Well, are, are they well, embracing this? So. They they embrace it. So, in 2016, they gave me a million dollars or not me personally, the University of Iowa, uh, was awarded a million dollars to study a low-fat diet uh, uh, compared to the modified paleo diet. So basically the Swank versus the Walls diet. Uh, and uh, that study showed that compared to the observation period, both Swank and Walls reduced fatigue, improved quality of life, and that Walls was about 50% more effective than Swank. But both, both were good. So if the Swank diet speaks to you more than the Walls diet, by all means, do the Swank diet, because you'll, you'll, be, you'll be helped. Um, if the Walls diet speaks more, you know, then do the Walls diet. You know, I, I think it's and, admirable that you've 
uh, even though you're advocating the Walsh diet, you're you're not an absolutist, and you you make room for the fact that some people may want more keto, some a little bit more vegetarian or Mediterranean, and there's some. It's a framework, right? It's not a rigid. Uh, uh, not rigid. It, it, you know, it, it just look at it again from an ancestral health perspective. If we accept that we came, we originated in Africa, we migrate up to uh, Europe, have a war, a hundred thousand year war with the Neanderthals, assimilate them, and then, you know, go into Asia, Australia, North South America. We eat a wide variety of foods you know, from a wide variety of ecosystems. Clearly, there's not going to be one diet that is the only diet that works for us. And if we look at the uh, where we have people who have societies that people thrive to 100, there are a wide variety of, uh, of uh, dietary patterns where people can thrive to 100. There's never going to be one correct diet. There are many helpful diets. There's one terrible diet, and that's a diet high in added sugar and processed foods. So whatever progress you can make away from that terrible diet towards one of these better diets, that is, you know, I, I'm happy to endorse that. And I also tell my tribe that if you are finding someone who says there's only one diet, that is the indication that that person has um, too much uh, hubris, uh, and they are incorrect. There never will be just one diet. There are many diets that are helpful. Some diets may be more helpful for you than, than others, and it may be for my genes and for my uh, microbiome. There's one or two diets that are most helpful for me, and there are three or four diets that are somewhat helpful. And there's uh, one diet, this, the standard West Side diet, that is really terrible. Yeah. Well, listen, I, I think it's great that you went from there's a lot of skepticism and even being banned to being accepted, embraced, and now even getting an article published in a top journal like Neurology, which is top, top of the tier. line, top, top tier. tier. So you've definitely climbed that hill. And uh, I guess I'd like to end by talking about where you're going next. You're recruiting for another yeah. clinical trial. Do you want to say something about that? Yeah. So we have a new trial, the efficacy of diet on quality of life and multiple sclerosis. Um, uh, people with relapsed or emitting MS age 18 to 70, uh, you must be willing to be randomized to the modified paleo diet, which is basically the Walls diet, or a time-restricted auto ketogenic diet, or usual diet. So that if you're eating, let's say you're a Mediterranean diet person, uh, you have to be willing to be randomized and that you'll go keto or paleo. But if you're usual, you get to stay on your Mediterranean. If you're already on the Walls diet, you're like, okay, I want to be in this. And if you're randomized to the keto diet, you're like, okay, I'll go keto. But if you're in the usual care arm, you get to keep eating your Walls diet the way you want. Key is that you have to be willing to be randomized. Our primary measure of interest is can we reduce your fatigue, improve your quality of life. Uh, and then we'll also look at your mood, uh, and we'll look at some uh, functions, uh, walking function, hand function, vision function, uh, working memory. And then the thing that I'm really excited about, Todd, is because it's a two-year study, we are looking at brain volume changes over two years. All of us who have MS, as a group, our brains are shrinking at about 1% per year or, or more, which is why we are at higher rates of frailty, needing assisted living, needing nursing home care. But we, it's my hypothesis, and this is because clinically I see very consistently that people's mental clarity improve, their uh, mood improves, their uh, cognition and memory improve as they uh, implement either one of these diets. 
So I actually am very hopeful that I can get people back to healthy rates of brain volume loss. Uh, and because I'm giving tips to the uh, control group on how they can, you know, eat more of these radical things known as vegetables and less processed foods that I, I expect all three groups will improve. And I think it's quite possible that all three groups will get to healthy rates of brain volume loss. Or at least, a, a, yeah, it's, it's very exciting. I, I think that will be the most interesting part of the, of the study because the DMTs do a great job of turning off relapses. They do a great job of reducing the new enhancing lesions. They do not stop fatigue, anxiety, depression, or brain volume loss. Uh, and so uh, if we're able to do, you know, have an impact on fatigue, anxiety, uh, memory, and brain volume loss, that, that is huge. I love how it's combining the subjective, the functional, and even the, the biometric, you know, measures of brain volume loss. So you're actually going to be doing scan, scans and quantifying uh, yeah. brain and atrophy. Scans are, are no contrast. So we have a little stronger magnet. There's no contrast. Uh, we get that at baseline, get that at 24 months. And if you, uh, if your medical team gives you a, um, a little adamant or a um, mild relaxant so you can stay calm, because some people find it very anxiety producing to be in a scanner, uh, uh, it's fine for you to take your usual um, relaxing medication before uh, going into the scan. Where are you in the recruitment process? Do you still have openings for so people to apply? We have 100 people in. Mm -hmm. uh, we are approved to enroll 156. Uh, so that means basically I have about 50 to go. Uh, and I, I'm, I anticipate recruiting through the end of um, this year and probably um, into the first couple months of January. I'm hopeful, Todd, you can help me get another 50. I would love to do that. Can you say again, what are the, can, the criteria you have to meet? So you, so you uh, need to be between the age 18 and 70, have relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis, be willing to come to Iowa at month zero, month three, month 24. You can uh, live in Canada, the United States, or Mexico. We do have several people from Canada. I think we have uh, one person from Mexico. Uh, and you have to be willing to be randomized. This is great. So uh, I think you've given us the information. Uh, if, if people want to learn more about the study, you go to terrywalls.com forward slash MS study. Say that one more time. Terrywalls.com forward slash MS study. That's T E R R Y Walls W A H L S dot com forward slash MS study. And we'll, we'll be sure to put that up. It's very exciting. So um, I guess in the final minutes, can you say anything else about uh, what's next for uh, Terry Walls? What, what, what's next in terms of projects? You know, I think it, uh, if you haven't been following me on Instagram, I think everyone should follow me on Instagram because then you can see uh, what I'm eating and doing. Uh, that is uh, lots and lots of fun. Uh, and if you go to uh, terrywalls.com, be sure and sign up for my emails because there you get to see um, once a week I send out a, um, a research roundup where I uh, discuss a couple of interesting papers that I've seen. And the things that I, I tend to discuss are studies that talk about things that are under our control. Uh, and that's uh, diet, uh, meditation, mindfulness, exercise. Um, so what is the research showing? in terms of how things under our control can influence uh, disease uh, progress. And again, I'll remind everyone, this is not just multiple sclerosis. This is any systemic autoimmune disease. Uh, and it's probably also true for people with a neurologic problem, uh, Parkinson's and cognitive decline. It's been super helpful for those uh, people as well.
Do you think it could help people with uh, ME-CFS and long COVID? Um, so people with uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, yes. Uh, uh, for those folks, uh, in general, uh, we have them uh, start uh, and they take a much more gradual transition from their current diet and lifestyle into uh, the WALS protocol. Uh, so for them, we have them work on gradually adding the good stuff as they gradually remove the uh, sugar and processed foods. You know, in, in ideally, uh, Todd, what you can do is find a uh, practitioner with whom you can work uh, who can help personalize all this uh, and watch uh, uh, as you make these uh, stepwise uh, contributions or stepwise changes. Great. Well, this has been fantastic to talk with you today, Terry. Uh, you've had a long uh, trajectory of starting from personal experience, expanding outward, doing clinical trials, writing books, helping so many people. It's a it's a, of high interest to those of us in the ancestral health community. Yeah. We hope to maybe have you speak at one of our future conferences too, if you're up for it. Yes, I would love to do that. I would love to come back. It That's would great. be uh, so much fun. All right. Well, thanks for talking with us today. Thank you. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Ancestral Health Today. We hope you enjoyed our discussion on how evolutionary insights can inform modern health practices. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast to catch future episodes.